Good evening, everyone. It is such an honor to officially kick off the 2023 Today's Dietitian Symposium. All right. All right, we have so much to celebrate tonight. So I ask all of you to raise your glass and join me in a toast. First and foremost, to all the moms, aunts, grandmothers, and caretakers. Happy Mother's Day. Cheers. And second, a huge congratulations to today's dietitian who is celebrating 10 years of this very symposium. Congratulations and cheers to everyone. As we celebrate tonight, we are so excited to engage with each and every one of you on empowerment or shame, how are biases shaping the way dietitians communicate about nutrition. My name is Amy Cohn. I am a registered dietitian. I have worked proudly at General Mills for 15 years. I am a lifelong lover of cereal. I am a huge, thank you for that, yeah. <laughs> I am a huge advocate for destigmatizing weight bias and a gargantuan champion of affordable, accessible nutrition for all. All right, I want to take you all back to the year 2020. Ah, yeah. There is no denying that 2020 was a year like no other, with a global pandemic and a national reckoning on racial justice and the intersection between them. 2020 had a substantial impact on the lives of all Americans. Now, the pandemic wasn't the only thing that happened in 2020, but it infected almost everything. When the virus came here to the United States, it found a country with serious underlying conditions and it exploited them ruthlessly, including the field of nutrition and dietetics. Chronic issues like hidden hunger, racial injustice, structural racism, and a divided dietetic and nutrition community went untreated for years. And we had learned to live uncomfortably with the symptoms. It took the scale and the intimacy of a pandemic to expose their severity, to shock us Americans with the realization that we are in a high risk category. I think The Atlantic summed it up best. The coronavirus didn't break America. It revealed what was already broken. And not just as society as a whole, it shined a harsh spotlight on our profession. Thus, individually as humans and collectively as a community of nutrition and dietetic professionals, we deepened our awareness. We deepened our consciousness to the complexities of others' experiences especially racial and economic diversity. And we translated this awareness into action, where strategies to help diversify nutrition were the main theme. And I want to take this moment right now to showcase to all of you the very action that we took within our societal system. Now, when I say we, I mean dietitians. And when I say our societal system, I mean the societal system that exists within the nutrition and dietetic community. All right, let's start off with policy. From a policy perspective, we took action. In September of 2022, where President Biden hosted the first White House conference on hunger, nutrition, and health in over 50 years. 
Now at this conference, dietitians not only shared our collective knowledge as the food and nutrition experts, but we led that conversation to help improve our nation's health. And then organizations took action, like our very own Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, who made inclusion, diversity, equity, and access a cornerstone of its organization. Now, there is no denying that we have a shining example within our community, diversified dietetics, which became even more important in the pursuit of equitable and inclusive nutrition for all. And as food insecurity swept more broadly across our nation, food banks took action and rose to the challenge in communities across America and became hunger heroes for many, right? And hundreds of dietitians not only work at these food banks, but volunteer at these food banks across America. And hundreds more helped shine a spotlight on the problem of hidden hunger through their communication and education. And then lastly, as individuals, many of you took action and examined your communications and identified ways to be more effective with diverse populations and experiences. Now, just to prove to you how far we have come, here are some headlines that existed in media before the year 2020. Now, as you can see, they're pretty negative, right? They likely contain a very negative article about what many in this room would say are affordable, accessible, nutrient-dense foods that can be found in the center of the store. And yep, sure enough, as you can see, ready-to-eat cereal often got villainized. But you even see a headline there focused on body weight, literally questioning why it was easier to be skinny in the 1980s, featuring an image of the iconic Jane Fonda, a white, wealthy woman. After the year 2020, you can all clearly see the action that individual dietitians took to help change the conversation to not only be more positive, but more inclusive. And that is because of the action that many of you as dietitians took. You have influenced the nutrition narrative to be more positive. You have changed the conversation to be more inclusive. You are recommending and communicating more effectively across all demographics to help provide good nutrition recommendations for all Americans. And we are excited to advance that conversation with all of you tonight to two extremely relevant challenges to nutrition leadership, body shaming and food shaming, along with introducing fitness shaming so that you can continue to engage more effectively with diverse audiences, convey messages that resonate, and ultimately work toward greater nutrition equity. Ugh. But my God, the nutrition noise continues. Now, this is the noise that I call the gluttony and sloth media approach that minimizes the complexity of health and well-being by the simplicity blame game of pointing the finger at processed foods, pointing the finger at lack of activity, and pointing the finger and having the gall to call the consumer lazy. This noise is also amplifying that weight loss is easy and fast and simple, which we all know it is anything but that. But it goes beyond media headlines. The messages we have heard and the images we have seen have been ingrained in our society so much so they, that they have not only been normalized and accepted as truth, but are celebrated with a righteous enthusiasm that has become a moral virtue. Categorizing people 
by the way they look, by the way they eat, and by the way they move into either good or bad. So where does this leave the consumer? It leaves them with simple sounding, but very ineffective prescriptions for action. It leaves them confused. It absolutely leaves them overwhelmed. And it ultimately leaves them feeling shame. Thus, the journey and the work as nutrition leaders, nutrition educators, nutrition communicators, and nutrition influencers continues, propelling you and us to take another step forward on this journey to better help consumers. Tonight, we're going to take that next step. We will disarm the confusion by understanding the consumer's perceptions of food and fitness versus our own as registered dietitians and versus those of certified fitness professionals. We will recognize and identify each step of the consumer's cycle of shame. We will recognize one's own biases and role in aiding consumers to make the best food and fitness choices that fit their needs and lifestyle. And we will derail the cycle of shame through acknowledging the real effort and struggle consumers have, while also positioning the power of simple nutrition communication, but not in despite of consumers' reality, but rather alongside their reality. And we will do this by unveiling the first ever comprehensive research study that authenticates the realities of these issues. Now, when we embarked on the topic of food shaming over the last year, let me be clear, we found plenty of information on the topic of food shaming in mainstream media. But when we started to look at published nutrition research, we found nothing. Zero. Zilch. And so General Mills took it upon ourselves to ignite and fund the research. But let me be clear, we funded the research, but we left the researchers from Southpaw Insights to conduct and interpret the findings. And those results are in, and they serve as the backbone for tonight's presentation. Thus, it is my pleasure to bring Jessica Broom from Southpaw Insights to the podium to share with you that very research. Thanks, Amy, and thank you all so much for being here. Happy Mother's Day, and happy Other's Day. <laughs> And especially thanks to General Mills for commissioning this really important work. I'm the founder of Southpaw Insights. We are the research agency that did this study. We are a small business based in Brooklyn. I actually live really near Brooklyn Hospital, and there were a few months in 2020 where New York City was the epicenter of the COVID-19 pandemic. It was a really dark and scary time in the city. Sometimes there were days where all we would hear were sirens, just day and night, constantly. Um, living through those early weeks of the pandemic was probably one of the most frightening things I've ever been through, both as a small business owner and just as a person living in the world. But Every night at seven o'clock in those early months of the pandemic, people all over the city would come outside or lean out their windows and clap and scream and bang on pots and pans to cheer for the healthcare workers. And as you got closer and closer to the hospital in my neighborhood, the cheering just sort of escalated until it turned into a full-on socially distanced party um, this is a cell phone video from like April of 2020 in that year. So those seven o'clock 
lectures really became kind of the highlight of my day for a while there. And it was just a little shot of light in a really dark time. And I hope that's what you all will see tonight in our presentation. Some of the content we're going to share with you is quite heavy. But I think there's also a hopeful note. So I'd encourage you to look to the light. Before I get into the study findings, I want to tell you a little bit about Southpaw Insights. We are proud to be a certified women-owned, disability-owned small business. And our mission is to do meaningful research that helps organizations understand people, what they think, how they feel, and what they do. Our expertise is in primary research. We do both quantitative surveys for breadth and qualitative work like interviews, focus groups, ethnographies for depth. We like to say our work is statistically relevant and emotionally resonant. This study came about last summer when Amy called me and she said, you know, I'm really interested in this idea of food shaming, but we can't find any research about it. Can we just do our own study? I cannot say no to the queen of cereal. So we designed a study talking to consumers, registered dietitian nutritionists, and fitness professionals around the country to really highlight this need for equity in fitness and nutrition and to shine a light on the shame that we knew was out there. This was a mixed method study. We started with online surveys of consumers, RDNs, and fitness professionals, and then followed that with a series of one-on-one -on -one in depth interviews. I really like this approach because I think the quantitative survey data and the qualitative interview findings kind of layer on top of each other and create this really rich, nuanced story. I can tell you all day long that 44% of consumers have experienced shaming, but I think when you see some of the videos we're going to show you and hear people talk about what it looked like and what it felt like, it really puts a face to those numbers. We talked to a pretty robust sample size of, of folks, 2,003 consumers, 250 RDNs, 251 fitness professionals. One note here, you'll hear us all talk about RDNs and FPs, where we're using FP as this umbrella category that includes both certified fitness professionals and registered yoga teachers. We're not going to break those two audiences out for purposes of today's talk. The consumers that we talked to looked like what the country looks like. About one in three were people of color. Almost half, 47%, had less than 50K in annual household income. And more than half, 57%, had less than a four-year degree. So I like to show this slide to level set a bit. I think some of these data points might be surprising. This is not what this room looks like. But this is what the country looks like. So this is who we talked to. The key lines of questioning in the consumer survey were around philosophies and approaches to food and fitness, struggles and challenges people have in this area, and then digging into this idea of shame. So what did we find? For the most part, consumers told us they live by very sensible sounding food philosophies, like listen to your body, everything in moderation. And just like they've internalized this messaging, they've also internalized messaging about what to avoid. So say no to sugar, processed foods are bad, shop the perimeter. 95% of consumers told us they think the perimeter of the grocery store is where they can find the most nutrition. And when we asked people what sections of the supermarket they try to avoid, we heard candy, snacks, bakery, and about one in five, 19%, say they avoid the breakfast cereal aisle, most often because they're concerned about sugar. So that's food. 
Fitness also looms large in people's lives. Nine out of 10 consumers told us they get at least some exercise occasionally. Two out of three say they'd like to exercise more. And when we asked about wellness goals, exercising more rose to the top of the list, uh, both as a short-term and long-term wellness goal. But we see a lot of guilt around when I can't manage to exercise. And almost half of consumers saying, I don't have the body type that's usually found in a gym or studio setting. Here's a quote from one of our consumer respondents, Migdariana. She says, sometimes at the gym, I have no idea what I'm doing. I don't know if I look crazy or not. And I'm kind of scared to ask someone because it's not the gym's responsibility to make you feel comfortable. This idea of discomfort came up over and over. 40% of consumers told us they're uncomfortable in their skin. They're embarrassed by the size of their clothes. This quote from another consumer respondent really stuck with me. Julie was probably 45 years old and she said, um, that when she was a kid, her mom would buy the slim pants for her sister, but she had to have the regular. There's just this insidious societal pressure to look a certain way. The next quote I'm going to share is from a dietitian. I don't know if this will make you laugh or cry, but Michelle said, as women, we get unsolicited comments about food and our bodies all the time, like from birth to death. truth, right? Losing weight is top of mind for consumers. It was the number one wellness goal, both short term and long term. This says to me, consumers don't think they're going to succeed. Like, it's my short term goal, but it's also my long term goal. It's just this dark cloud that hangs over us. So here's where we are. Consumers get all this messaging. Processed foods are bad but eat everything in moderation. Listen to your body, but you should be skinny. So not surprisingly, we are a bit flummoxed. We're overwhelmed, we're uncomfortable in our skin, so what do we do? We grab onto these simple sounding messages, right? Eat less, move more. No processed foods. We think somewhere in there is this magic bullet. And that's where the cycle of shame begins. I hear these simple messages. I think it should be easy. I'll just eat this, not that. I'll just buy an air fryer. <laughs> but I hate to break it to you, it's not that simple. And I would even say that some of these catchy little phrases actually undermine the struggles and challenges consumers are going through, right? Reality is not so straightforward. My mom likes to say, real life is not linear. Let's hear that from a consumer. For time, I would say it's just like, you know, after working a full-time job every day, you work your eight hours, you come home, I have two kids, you know, we got to feed the kid and family life. And then there's always like something to do after work. And then you only have so much time to yourself where some days I'm just like, okay, I'll skip the gym today and I'll go tomorrow because I have so much to do today. I guess that kind of, in a sense, works its way into motivation um, just because I'm, I'm not helping myself in, in the matter, you know, I'm just brushing it off and pushing it off to the next day. And then by the end of the week, I feel horrible for not going, for skipping two or three days, you know? Um, so then the motivation just kind of goes down. So all this simple advice we hear might be easy if we didn't have to worry about things like time and cost and motivation. But as we see, people worry about these things all the time. And the cycle of shame goes on. I hear these simple messages. I think it should be easy. I try to do what I'm told, but I find it's not that simple, right? You heard her. There's always something to do after work. And then I don't meet my goals and then I feel horrible. So where are RDNs and fitness professionals in all this? I thought this was a really interesting contrast in the data. We asked professionals, what do you tell your clients to think about when they're choosing what to eat? What criteria should they consider? 
Both RDNs and fitness professionals named things like protein, nutrients, fiber, calories, and then all the way down at the bottom, you see highlighted in blue, taste and cost. But when we ask consumers the same question, what do you think is at the top of their list? <laughs> taste and cost, right? Sugar, calories, protein, all these things fall down the list when the rubber meets the road, when the grocery cart meets the aisle. So they're doing, this is the opposite of what RDNs recommend, but it's not the opposite of what RDNs do. When we asked RDNs, what about your own food choices? What are you thinking about? What's <laughs> top of your list? <laughs> Taste and cost. They're just like us. So we have kind of a do as I say, not as I do situation here. I think what we need is the opposite. Consumers need RDNs to be real. Consumers hold RDNs in very high esteem, right? We love y'all. Most consumers think RDNs are extremely knowledgeable. Half of the consumers we talked to said, yeah, if I had time or money, I would seriously consider working with an RDN. I think consumers would be relieved to hear, RDNs care about taste and cost just like I do. RDNs know what it's like to experience this cycle of shame, right? You've been there. You're not skinny enough. You're not healthy enough. You're an RD. I don't believe you're eating that. <laughs> right? 62% of the RDs we surveyed said that they had personally experienced food shaming. That's almost two out of three. Look to your left. Look to your right. <laughs> We're lucky if one of you hasn't had this experience of being shamed. Consumers need RDNs to be authentic, to tell it like it is. But instead, we have this disconnect. And we see it again when we talked about approaches or strategies around food. Almost three quarters of RDNs, 72%, recommend intuitive or mindful eating. But only 16% of consumers have actually ever tried this. Same with fitness professionals. We have half of them telling their clients to eat clean. Bro. <laughs> but only 17% of consumers have ever practiced clean eating. One philosophy I think we should bring more into the public eye is this one. Food should be affordable, nutritious, and enjoyable. Sounds pretty good. 72% of RDNs have told their clients this. Not even one in three consumers have ever heard it. Why is that? Imagine what it would be like if this was the soundbite we heard all the time. Instead of eat less, move more, eat this, not that. You can never be too rich or too thin. I want to show one more video from an RDN talking about the nutrition community and what you all know versus just Joe and Jane on the street. I remember being at a conference right before the pandemic and one of the speakers talked about intuitive eating and anti-weight loss and the audience was literally cheering. The health at every size movement. Uh, I don't feel like it's taken over, but it definitely has a big presence in the dietitian world. But in the general public, no. I think mainstream society is still 10 years behind. So here's where we are. RDNs are touting intuitive eating. Consumers are just trying to get through the day. They're buying what they can afford. They're buying what their kids can eat. And then they're feeling bad about it. So one of our questions tonight is, how can we bridge this great disconnect, this great divide, and derail that cycle of shame for everybody? So we'll get back to the great disconnect in a minute. Right now, Amy's gonna talk about some of these findings through an equity lens. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. <laughs> So I want to bring up that the barriers are more prevalent for households with a lower income, and that's exactly what this chart is showing you. What this is showing is the barriers that are keeping consumers from where they want to be with their nutrition and fitness goals. 
you can see there are two income demographics. We have households with an income less than $50,000 a year, and then we have households with an income higher than $50,000 a year. And the households with the lower income cite costs, money, and lack of motivation as the top two barriers for them achieving their fitness and nutrition goals. Whereas the households with a higher income cite work, uh, family responsibilities, and, uh, and, and time. So basically those households are saying they're just too busy. And we bring this up because income inequality persists in the United States. This chart shows you the real median household income by race and Hispanic origin from 1967 to 1920, I'm sorry, to 2021. I think I have a, oh, kind of hard with both of these charts, but in the middle there, you can see all races, the annual income was around $71,000 a year. Now, what I know you all can clearly see is that for Hispanic Americans and black Americans, they fall very short of that. And women take the brunt. For every dollar a white non-Hispanic male earned in 2022 in the United States, women got paid on average 82 cents on the dollar. Now, Asian women did a bit better 97 cents on the dollar, but far short than the white male counterpart. Black women, 79 cents on the dollar. Native American women, uh, 71 cents on the dollar. And uh, Latina Hispanic women, 78 cents on the dollar. We elevate this economic inequality because the pandemic may have reminded us that we are all in the storm, but we are certainly not in the same boat. And this is holding true right now with inflation. Inflation is reminding us Americans, we're all in this together. But it is also showing us how dangerously far apart we are. So I'm now gonna hand it over to JC Lippold, who is gonna dig into equity. First in fitness, and then he's gonna dig into it with food and nutrition. JC. Hey. Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to Savannah. Um, I'm not a dietitian, um, and I'd like to apologize for the fitness industry for giving so much <laughs> nutrition advice to all of America without any right or reason to do so. So if you're wondering why we're weaving in this conversation of fitness tonight, you hear it all the time. How often do your clients, your family, your, your loved ones go, hey, um, so what should I be doing for my, for, for my overall wellness? What should I, how should I move? What gym should I be going to? So we can do all of our talk on the food side of things, but then all of a sudden we know that often this conversation is not always within our hands. So I like doing exercises um, in my mind to contextualize where we're at. So I'm going to invite you to do one while I do it um, alongside you. So if we think about inclusivity and accessibility and fitness, um, we're going to ask two questions. Uh, who does the industry target? And I'm going to use the term the industry as if a consumer looking at food or fitness. Um, because from their lens, they may not break it down. At the top of the pyramid, so uh, the, the smallest part, the loudest voices, industry and fitness targets, white. I always say 25 to 45 year old women who have a bachelor's degree in English, who live in the second ring suburb, who work at the da 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 da. Think about the ads, think about, think about the model of the gym. If you go to a gym, think about who you see when you're there. Next down, it's the social extroverted aspiring to lose weight. Uh, it still costs some money, um, but it's the place where it's a little less serious, it's a little bit more sustainable, it's, it's filling in a lot more of the gaps with, within the person's needs. Next down, families, low financial barrier, uh, relaxed social standards. You don't have to wear 
Lululemon. You don't have to um, put on makeup to go to the gym because you're bringing your three kids, dropping them off the nursery, da 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 da. And at the bottom, the inexpensive, the, the no judgment. So uh, what brands fit these, fit these uh, um, parts of the pyramid? The top, Equinox, Lifetime Fitness. The, the high-level boutiques, SoulCycle, Berries, Rumble, Solid Core, Core Power. Uh, personal Training, Peloton. Again, this is, this, is, this is me simply going in my head Huh, if I was going to look at what I hear the most, where I see the most time, the most energy being put into, this is JC filling in a pyramid. Next down, Orange Theory. You have a team, you have, a, you, you have an environment. Feral's extreme body shaping. 10 week thing that you move through together with other people and you may be going like, hey, that's mine. That's where I go, that's what I love doing. Um, a little less expensive, CrossFit, right? There's a family, an energy to it. Families, low financial barriers, the YMCA. Hey, I need to bring my kid to the daycare so I can get my workout, and then I can do, 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 do. And then inexpensive, no judgment. Planet Fitness. Crunch. Planet Fitness, Pizza, pizza Tuesdays, right? <laughs> Literally, Pizza Tuesdays. I love it. $10 a month. All right. Here's a non-food person. Uh, within this conversation, a consumer going, what do I see? Who's at the top of the pyramid? Who does the industry target? Kind of the same. Women, white, wealthy. Um, I'll, it'll clarify when you get the other side of what, what I mean by non-athletic here. 40s. Next down. Moms, people who struggle with that last 10 to 15 or that first 10 to 15 or the 10 to 15 that came back again because I had the thing that led to the 10 to 15 coming back. <laughs> Next down. Consumers looking for the quick fixes, the hopeless, the exhausted. And at the bottom, straight up, the hopeless. All those other things fall away and I go, well, I'll try something. You may be surprised at some of the things I put into the food category at the top here. What brands serve who? The cool sculpting, the med spas, the liposuction, right? The things that have nothing to do with consumption but within that consumer's mindset, they go, how do I accomplish the thing I want to accomplish? The private chef, the one-on-one -on -one dietitian. Again, lots of money signs. Moms, people struggling with 10 to 15 pounds. The Weight Watchers, the Jenny Craigs, the Juice Cleanses, the Herbalife, the Beach Bodies, the meal, it still costs money, right? But it's something that I can go, okay, this is showing that I'm investing in myself. I'm taking my me time. The mom taking their me time by doing what? By investing money in, it's like, or maybe you could do something different for yourself, like, you know, reading a book, going for a walk, having someone else take care of your kid for a moment and realize, wow, I have a lot going on, and I deserve to be fulfilled and sustained for a moment. Consumers looking for quick fixes, hopeless, exhausted. The gimmicks. I listed ones from a consumer lens. You can see them. And the bottom category? I have no idea. <laughs> I don't. The, the, the family who shops at the, at the convenience store in North Minneapolis because the nearest grocery store, I'm from Brooklyn Center, Minnesota, in the last uh, year. Someone knows Brooklyn Center? Yeah. Maple, hey, Minnesota, woo! <laughs> um, Target, Target is, my small, is my small business that I love supporting being from Minnesota. Target closed down in Brooklyn Center. We just lost our Walmart. Who is the family? Um, what, is, what, is the, what is the thing that they're going to find? What are, how are we speaking to them about their food wellness? I don't know. The reason why I do this exercise is because this next slide plays into what Amy was just talking about. Here's why I think equity really matters in this conversation. Self-perception by race and ethnicity. I'm going to say these stats, and then I'll say why I think this is interesting to me. I feel comfortable in my own skin. In my own skin, Black Americans had the highest uh, percentage of saying, "Yeah, that's true," strongly or somewhat agree. Next, I don't have the body type that is usually found in a gym or fitness studio setting. Black Americans, lowest percentage out of the three. When I eat certain foods, I feel like I did something wrong. Black Americans agree the least. Lastly, I feel pressured by society to strive for certain physical attributes. Black Americans again lowest. 
For once in the American narrative, black Americans are actually coming out on top of something in the way that we set them up for success. Why? Because our food narrative doesn't, and our fitness narrative don't address them. The shame narrative of going, eat less, move more, do this, work your way up, spend more money to get to the top of the pyramid of where you're seeing things are going. Who is that being targeted to? Yeah. Black Americans saying, I feel comfortable in my own skin. It speaks to two things. Number one, the ineffectiveness of our narrative and who we're directing it towards, and the intuitive nature of how human beings can feel about themselves if they are empowered to listen to who they are, the people who love and support and surround them. So let's get back to the cycle. Spiraling into people into isolation, guilt, and shame. So isolation. As Jessica shared before, we hear simple messages. So we think our uh, walk towards greater wellness should be simple. We do those things. We find out it's not simple. Who do we blame? Ourselves. And then, what do we do? We isolate. St. Augustine, hundreds and hundreds of years ago, said, I started feeling what was happening through me, from me, into the world of what I was doing, and I was ashamed of it. So I incurvat to say, I curved in on myself. And in this darkness, lost perception, lost power, lost path of where I could go, of what I could do. Many choose to go it alone and hide away. 67% of consumers said they want to keep their fitness goals to themselves. 64% want to keep their nutrition goals to themselves. Ronald. I discover sometimes I have to find the strength within myself to accomplish my goals, you know? I have no one else, no partner to help me, encourage me. Again, as Jessica raised, uh, the, the base for um, this research may not look like what this room does. So think about where men often fit within a wellness conversation. I say this all the time. I know a lot more single eligible female identifying human beings in my life than I do male identifying human beings in my life. Why? Because female identifying human beings are doing a lot more work on themselves. Where are the men? Sit in the basement, oversized t-shirt, not feeling, not thinking, not expressing, not doing anything. I'm wondering where they are. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I try. Hey, the wine is setting in, everybody. But no, seriously, I absolutely, I agree. It's getting fun. So imagine the following situations. Uh, falling over in a fitness class. 65% of consumers said they would have a negative response to this. 33%, one out of three would feel humiliated. And what do they do after they fall over? They never show up again. Um, and thank you, keep, keep vocalizing. Because this is, this is when this starts settling in. So use your voices, I appreciate it. Bumping into your doctor at the grocery store, 51% said, Net negative response, 28% saying they're going to feel judged, especially if they're in what part of the grocery store when they bump into them. Thank you. <laughs> Bumping into someone you want to impress while exercising, 43% net negative, 17% feeling anxious. All of these feelings bring us where? Into isolation. 35% said if it was possible to go unnoticed, I would join a new gym, I would try a new workout. If I could be invisible, I would start to work on myself. So then I would one day want to be not invisible. I feel like a failure and I turn inward. The next step of this cycle. So when we feel that, what happens? We take some time to discern what's, what, what's been going on and who's responsible for it. I am. Let's shine some light on the, on the fitness professionals in this conversation for a bit. Tough love is a really popular way. I think, I think the gym is the only place in the world where words like push and kick and kill are actually ways that we compliment someone. <laughs> hey, thanks for kicking my ass today. <laughs> where else would that ever be deemed as a safe, positive, uh, from heart to someone else way? But it's true. We think we need to kick, push, pull, 
in order to do something good for ourselves. 51% feel guilty when they cannot exercise. 42% feel guilty when they eat certain foods. Hey, Ronald's back. I don't want to pursue my fitness goals by myself. I think I'd feel lonely and just relapse. I have no one else, no partner to help and encourage me. The isolation, the guilt, ping-ponging, back and forth. Migdariana, who we're going to get to see again in a moment. I'm not going to say this quote out loud because she's going to say it out loud. And every time I watch it, and I watch it religiously, you go, Jiminy Crickets. How have we brought people to that place? And by we, I mean the big we of society. Because the we in this room, you're doing a lot of the work to shine light on this cycle. Fitness professionals exacerbate the guilt. We say there is nothing wrong with encouraging people to push themselves to get the body they want. 65% of consumers agree. 74% say there is nothing wrong with giving people helpful advice about healthy diets, even if it makes them feel guilty about their food choices. Again, I apologize. But also, I apologize to the people who are receiving the, wait, so I need to do... I need to feel this way in order to accomplish me becoming a better person. 42% of consumers follow suit and agree. 67% of fitness professionals tell clients they did something wrong when they eat certain foods. 52% of fitness professionals say when clients can't manage to exercise, I make them feel guilty. What day of the week are you never supposed to miss for a workout? Monday. Monday. Why? Because it starts as the same day as never miss. Never miss a Monday. What if you miss a Monday? Oh, it's okay. You can get back on track tomorrow. Oh, if you, if you binge this weekend, it's okay. Is it really okay? Because we only say it's okay to stop doing the, to, we only say it's okay to do the things that we set up as bad, right? 73% of fitness professionals support clients who work out to eat what they want to eat. Um, you may not be able to see it from here, but on the phone is a picture of the person working out but the donut's not in the picture. What do we show versus what do we carry with us inside? Hey. <laughs> and then the savior came down in the form of a dietitian to go ahead and bring light to the world. Artie Anderson is knowledgeable, but not relevant. RDNs are put on a pedestal and are out of reach for consumers. Here's the numbers. 62% of consumers believe RDNs are extremely knowledgeable. 20%, one out of five, feel that they are affordable. Nearly half of consumers have no idea how to start the process with you. 20% say nutrition suggestions from RDNs are not possible for my lifestyle or interpret this how you will, someone like me. Which I think helps us go, okay, well, what are they perceiving that I am? Who am I in their lens? Who are you in their lens? Because they're seeing themselves as someone different. Imagine the following situations. Now we'll do it with the RDNs. How do you feel of discussing eating habits um, with an RDN? 54% net negative. 22% feel judged. Ask, imagine an RDN will react negatively upon um, hearing about different things. 41% of people said the RDN would respond negatively to hearing about their trigger foods. Discussing the frequency of exercise. Again, one of those weird little crossovers. 43% net negative, 12% feeling guilty. One in three feel pressured to, for, by society to strive for certain culturally determined attributes. Thinner, more muscular, certain body shape. And I will say, right, this number is uh, based off of a representation of American society. If this number was um, who we're targeting, white, wealthy, da 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 oh by golly, this number would be a lot higher. Right? Even the desperation and desperation between the two is something to talk about. So, um, how many of y'all use social media with, within your work, within your passion, within your personal lives? Like, who's, who's a social media user? Cool. 
How often do we hear that the one problem, like the biggest, if we could just, if we could just get social media under control, that all of a sudden a lot of things would be better? Yeah, right? Not, not new news. Okay, who in this room existed before the conversation and reality of social media? Okay, let's play a game. I'm going to flash through the decades examples of media that was put out to society. I don't know, let's call it social media. Starting in the 1940s, shout out phrases or things that you see. Shout them out. 1940s. Helps him be fit. Someone ought to tell her about rye crisp. Want to be slim or attractive? Try the rye crisp reducing method. 1950s, shout them out. 1960s, shout them out. 1970s, shout them out. 1980s. A hard man is good to find. 1990s. You need it because you're weak. Diet Tango does not allow you to eat willy-nilly. Huh. 2000s. I needed to put the shake weight on, y'all. I needed to. And today. I'm going to make an observation. The laughter has got quieter as we got more recent. Because often it's hard to see the impact and the absurdity of what we are digesting as consumers until it's well in the past and we go, oh my gosh, how was that ever a thing? Shame. Because I'll say this, social media um, ain't all bad. Here's some research for you. Among consumers who use social media, one in three agree that it is motivating when a nutrition professional comes up on my social media feed. Black and Hispanic consumers are significantly more to agree with this than white consumers. Among consumers who use social media, one in four agree that social media has been helpful with my well-being goals. Black, Hispanic, significantly higher than white consumers. As we move into the shame part of this conversation, I like reading definitions straight from Google on what shame is. Because it is pervasive, it is sneaky. Here's the three a painful feeling of humiliation or distress caused by the consciousness of wrong or foolish behavior, a loss of respect or esteem, dishonor, a regrettable or an unfortunate situation or action. Shame moves that isolation and guilt into an exposed state where we go, look what I have done to myself. It's pervasive. When asked, um, are you familiar with body, food, fitness shaming? 92%, 83%, 74%. Sources of shame. Where do consumers perceive that the shame they feel is coming from? Social media, hey, number one. Friends and family. It's generational. It's things we, we're, we're taught. It's a way that we often show love. Because we care about people and society says, you will be more loved, you'll be more successful if you look, eat, feel, exist in a certain way. Family members are often willing to go to that place. Peer groups, work colleagues. When we're in a state of, of growing ourselves in our career and we look around at who is, is climbing and what they are doing. Uh, fitness and nutrition professionals featured on TV and the news and the medical professionals like primary doctors and pediatricians. But also, ourselves. Here's that McDariana quote um, uh, from her um, own words. Have you ever had anybody shame you because of what you ate or chose to buy? I wouldn't necessarily say anyone, but probably myself. If I eat something, say like I ate three bowls of cereals today or something, I'm like, well, at the end of the day, I'm like, wow, like that's a lot of cereal you ate today. Like, you know, like you need to control the sugar craving a little bit more or something, you know? Yeah. I, 
more, more myself than others. People attempting to figure out what are they supposed to do? What will make them right? What will make them enough? What will put them on the path of feeling better, of feeling grounded, of being able to say, my intuition, my self-confidence, all of these things are in a place of my ownership and awareness. I love this quote. There are two ways of spreading light, to be the candle or the mirror that reflects it. When we are in isolation, and that guilt amplifies everything that's coming in, it's very easy to go ahead and see shame as something that reflects and bounces. Right? How many of you know someone who, uh, outside of yourself, who you can go, wow, I see the shame you exist with, I wish you didn't have it, and I wish I could do something about it. Who, who knows or sees that person? Who can think of their, their client, their family member, their, their, their patient, the person on TV, the, the, the popularized identity, and you go, gosh. And how does that make you feel to go and see someone else existing in that pathway? You can either be the one, yeah, sad, right? You, you can either be the one holding it, like I am ashamed, or you can be the one seeing that person and then reflecting that around. Because there's long-term impacts of shame. Of those who have experienced shame, 88% have long-term impacts. Low self-esteem is the most common, 52%. Perpetual isolation is a coping me mechanism. We already spoke about it. Right? It doesn't go away. A preference to exercise alone, 36%. A preference to eat alone, 29%. I'm ashamed of myself, and society is ashamed of me. And in that moment, what do we, what do we end up feeling in that moment, do we think? Hopeless. Hopeless. Desperate. Like, we need to do something when? Now. Well, hey. By golly, look at that simple message. Here's my light. Here's my direction. I always bring attention to this one. Be 1% better each day. It sounds good. <laughs> I am 41. I should be 15,000% better than the day I was born. <laughs> How does that become something that we normalize? Because guess what? I, I, and I do this often on my social media. I go, hey, who's 1% better than they were yesterday? The most, the highest number I've ever had within this poll, 20%. 20%. But we hear that as, gosh, if I just do that 1% better every day, what are we missing out? The reality, the struggle, the, I, I, I do a lot of executive coaching, a lot of change work, and I say, progression is wonderful. Regression is wonderful. Stagnance is scary. But people regress. They miss something. They don't get 100 out of 100. And what do they do? They start in this cycle. The desperation leads them back again. It took not very long to put this cycle together. On a Zoom call, we were literally like, hey, here's a cycle. Bada boom, 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 boom. Someone's like, write that down. <laughs> is, this, is this surprising to anybody when you see it this way? It's like, or does, or, or does this kind of make sense? It resonates. Resonates? So, so what do we do? Um, as Amy raised and then Jessica shared wonderfully about, about the reality of 2020 and kind of the paradigm shift it forced all of us into, on the right-hand side here, this is um, uh, the um, front page of the Star Tribune on February 28th, 2020. Stocks are crashing. Vice President Pence is just down there saying, hey, there's something going on with uh, COVID. Um, and then up in the, up in the, the title here, um, that's, that's my very cold face in a Minnesota February morning, jumping up and down. Uh, they did a story on um, this social movement called 5K Everyday Conversations that I started on January 1st, 2020. 
I noticed that a large part of the world, a majority, says, I am not a runner. Here's the funny thing about, the, about running. It's a verb. We don't say, I do, oh, I'm not a sitter. Oh, I'm not a drinker. Oh, I'm not an eater. Oh, oh, I'm not a sleeper. Mm -mm, nope, nope, nope. But for some reason, we've turned run into meaning more than what the word means. So I'm like, gosh, could we create some space where we could reclaim the verb run? So every day we held space for conversational-based movement. Strangers would show up. I call those people people who do not know each other yet. And once everybody would show up, people would start moving at the pace of conversation. The pace of conversation would be the pace that people can be in conversation with. For every, every day, for the last three and a half years, what's the number one reason why people won't show up? They're because they're not runners, they're afraid they will slow people down at the pace of talking to somebody. So running some days was walking. Running some days was having a walker or a wheelchair. And I had so many run groups call me up and say, hey, how'd you get on the front page of the Star Tribune when the world's falling apart? I'm, they're like, well, we've been a run group forever. We have thousands of members. I go, because we're not a run group. We're a talking group. Movement all of a sudden became not the thing we were doing, not the intent of what we were doing, but a side dish to what we were doing, an, ex uh, an amplifier of what we were doing. All of a sudden, when Minneapolis was burning and was the center of the world for very good reasons, Minneapolis and Sable have a lot to work on. The Midwest has a lot to work on. But all of a sudden, uh, the picture in the top left here, um, quick story, that's Jesse Ross. He's a wonderful human being who's doing a lot of great work to deal with the inequity and the lack of conversation um, for especially black Americans and especially in Minneapolis. North Minneapolis is the place you do not go. He told me on a call once that he's a father of six. He would wake up at 4 a.m. every day to run around his neighborhood to get movement in before, as the work he does and the father he is, it was the only time he could move. Well, all of a sudden, when Minneapolis was burning, he could no longer go for a run in his neighborhood at 4 a.m., live in North Minneapolis. Why? Because the KKK were trolling the neighborhood, and he no longer felt safe walking out his front door to move in his neighborhood. So I'm like, Jesse, I'll come over, and we will uh, move together. Because an emotionally intelligent, straight-passing white guy in North Minneapolis is going to freak everybody out because we don't exist there. <laughs> so all of a sudden, at 4 a.m. on Wednesday mornings, we started having a 5K every day conversation and became a pilgrimage for a lot of suburbanites who were in the place like, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I'm not in this conversation. I'm afraid and I'm stuck. So a bunch of white suburbanites came into the bad part of town on Wednesday mornings at 4 a.m., to run up and down West Broadway. Movement, exercise, fitness. Why? Because all of a sudden people were realizing they needed something that was being taken away from them by the way that society was presenting it to them. People were becoming runners because they were acknowledging the world they were living in and who they were and the power that they had. Hey, there's me. <laughs> so I grew up in a, um, um, a very emotional, non-vocal, um, flamboyant um, child. My best friend was my piano. Um, I love the Minnesota Twins. Um, with all that being said, I grew up loving baseball. So my very alpha dad and my very alpha brother and I would play baseball in the backyard. My dad would throw the baseball to my brother. I didn't like the feel of the baseball on the bat because it made my arms shake and I would start crying. So my dad got a rag ball for my brother. For me, I loved it. I was getting to do something I loved doing, and in that space, in the smallness of my backyard, I felt safe. I gained confidence. I'm like, I'm gonna go to the park and play baseball. I got to the park, and all of a sudden I realized there wasn't a rag ball. I ran home, bawling. Not because anyone said anything, no one knew why it left. But all of a sudden, that little seed of shame, because how I perceived how I was supposed to exist, and I didn't fit into that top part of the, of the pyramid. So guess what I've never done again? I've never played baseball. I, I, like, I, I became a tennis player. Um, but I never played baseball again. But I'm still one of the most committed Minnesota Twins fans you're ever going to find. That seed of shame set in so early for me that for all of this time, I lived with it. Like all of those other people 
who live with impacts of shame. It's built into our systems. When you start thinking about this and you look at walls of gyms, at LA Fitness, there's a, there's a picture of someone doing yoga and it says, perfection. And you go, it's like, oh! Like, and all these things start hitting you. Um, has anyone heard of the cartoon Bluey? Yeah? They had to redo an episode because it, like, Bluey started in the bathroom, like, squeezing Bluey's belly fat. Um, and all of a sudden, a lot of people going, it's like, oh, maybe this is not right. Maybe every Disney villain should not be a fat, loud female who's scary, who's scary. Right? Maybe not every Disney princess should be what every Disney princess is. The name of the game today is not to stop these things. Because I, I don't think we can, especially in our lifetimes. But we can see it. We can acknowledge it. And then we can move forward with it. Shame becomes less powerful when it's brought into the light before it sends us into isolation, before we start carrying that guilt, before we start that cycle again and again. Now, in this image where the cycle is breaking, it can break any time. When we see it, when we help others see it, it loses its power. Let's play a game. There's shame within um, three examples. Let's see if we can find them. First one, I've been really lazy these last few months since school started. I've been so busy, I definitely should get back on a new plan. This is Migdariana again, right? Yeah, Migdariana. I want to meet her walking down the sidewalk someday and not freak her out by being like, oh my gosh, I love you. <laughs> Where's the shame in this sentence? Lazy. Lazy. Yeah. Get back. Should. Should. New. New plan. Yeah. You hit all of them. Really lazy for going back to college while raising two kids and working a full-time job. What does she really mean? I haven't been working out. The end. The start and the end. That's that. How does, how does our society phrase that? Lazy. This is my favorite one. I definitely should get back, past tense, to a new plan. <laughs> Jessica raised it before. Weight loss is our short-term goal and our long-term goal. It doesn't make sense. What does it say about the fitness industry? If the new thing is always the right thing to be doing, what does it say about the current thing and the old thing? It was, it was never meant to be magical or to work in the first place. Oh, like, what's the newest, hottest thing? Should get back on a new plan. Doesn't make sense. Hey, next one. I have, a sal I have the salad ingredients, but it's just easier to throw a pizza in the air fryer. Where's the shame? This one's harder. And all of these, yeah, so, 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 so there's, a, there's a, an unsaid laziness, but I think the shame is here. Air fryer. <laughs> Why did everybody buy an air fryer? Because it's healthier. And all of a sudden, they're humiliated, looking at the thing that is supposed to help them get to where they're supposed to be and where they want to be. And what are they doing? They're ruining it by eating the thing they're not supposed to eat. Like the Edith Wharton quote, the shame is being reflected within their actions. Lastly, mom of four who plans and executes a week-long Disney World vacation. What is the first thing she says when she gets home? Need to go on a diet. I need a vacation. <laughs> and I will say, and I haven't worked out in a week, which is kind of like I need to go on a diet, right? And in reality, the mom who's lugging four bags of child around for hours and hours a day, walking nonstop, I guarantee you she is working out more this week than she is when she's going to Orange Theory for 60 minutes on a Tuesday and sitting at a desk and doing the things and, and living the life of, of, of obligation. Shame. So how do we even begin considering to help? When something is special to us, we often make it hard for others to access. When we become the expert, we are often perceived as out of touch. These are two individual thoughts. 
I think the top one is one that you can do a little self-discernment on. Do you make these things that you care about and you know in and out and it's your vocation and your purpose? Do you do the work to make it something that someone can take the little bite of? I don't know. But the bottom one is what we've been talking about. When we become the expert, we are perceived as out of touch. Without anything that you do, and you know this is true, when someone knows that you were an RDN, how do they look at you? What would they say is at the top of your, here's how I make my food decisions? How many people are surprised when you are eating? What's your favorite thing that you eat that people are surprised that you eat? Go. Yeah, the cacophony of food that humans eat because it tastes good, because it costs, uh, because it's convenient. Maya, I'm gonna, I, Maya Feller said, uh, the, the food choices that you make have nothing to do with the morality of who you are as a human being. A lot of people would be like surprised by the things that you choose to eat, by the things you choose to recommend. The invitation is to come down off the high shelf. 54% of consumers feel judged, anxious, vulnerable when talking to you. 48% when talking to me. Do little things often. I'm going to provide a couple examples. But first, we got to present this um, for the first time in January, and two people who are in that room who I adore, um, one of them shared another one's story, and it just hit me in such a good way. Sarah Schlichter shared Nicole Rodriguez's story. Nicole Rodriguez did a eat McDonald's for 30 days, um, not exclusively, but had McDonald's every day along with the rest of the diet, and did uh, blood panels before and after, and, and then presented that. Sarah Schlichter. Here's how she responded to Nicole saying, hey, I'm done. Sarah said, I really enjoyed watching Nicole's uh, live through this, uh, live through this, and definitely wanted some of her french fries every day, LOL face. What comes up for you seeing a dietitian share this? Do you have any food biases or food shaming unconsciously happening? Many of us do, and it's helpful to acknowledge and learn from it. Sarah did not share opinion. Sarah did not open any doors. Sarah did not close any doors. Sarah courageously, curiously, and thoughtfully said what probably so many consumers and followers on her Instagram were thinking. And all of a sudden, they could think that thought courageously and curiously and thoughtfully because one of you showed the way. This moment was nothing. I asked Sarah, I was like, hey, Sarah, would be okay if I share this? She's like, yeah. I'm like, this is so cool. And she's like, really? I'm like, yes. She's like, awesome. <laughs> when we see it, when we share it, when we shine light on it, it begins to shift the way that we communicate and how people hear us. Because what if we started with the consumer is enough? You have the power to influence if they actually feel and see themselves as enough. What is enoughness? It's not complacency. It's not you don't need to change. You don't need to do anything different. It's right now you are thoroughly capable of doing something within everything you have and everything that you are that can bring joy, that can bring confidence and ownership of who you are and where you are, and that that may all of a sudden put you on a path of staying open to seeing who you are as a human being, that is already enough. One of the questions that came up last time we presented this is like, okay, it seems like everything I say could create shame. It seems like everything I say could be received in a really hard, bad way, because I have no idea what people are carrying. So how do I say anything? And this was my answer. Talk to the consumer, even though the shame may be the louder voice, or the voice that walks in first. I'm going to tell a quick story. Um, I opened up an Orange Theory studio, Burnsville, Minnesota. I had a 65-year-old woman, very scared to become a member. She's like, I can't, I won't, I'm not enough, da 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 I was like, you can do what you can, and it's going to be enough here. The parameters in an Orange Theory classroom, you get on the treadmill. Three and a half to four and a half miles an hour to power walk, four and a half to five and a half to jog, five and a half and above to go ahead and, uh, and to run. That's just how every coach is trained to talk. She got on the treadmill the first day we opened the studio, hit 3.5 miles an hour on the treadmill, way too fast for her. 
started crying, ran out of the studio, ran into the bathroom, sat on the bench. I ran in, I wasn't the coach, I was in the office, I ran in, and for the next hour, I talked her out of everything that was just affirmed for her. After that class got done, we walked back into the studio, got on the treadmill, her base pace was 0.7 miles an hour. 0.7, 500%, like more is the baseline that we set, and we don't even think that there's something there. She got to go, here's where I am, and this is enough. She stayed around. She found herself, she found acceptance, internal and external. Enoughness, awareness of what you have that can be put to use with no attachment to what tomorrow will bring. I'm going to give you two tenets. So this enoughness idea is something I talk a lot about. I have four tenets. I'm going to present two of them that I think are really uh, powerful to this conversation. First, minimize the minimizing language. Another way I like to say it is speak the truth as quickly as you can. I was only able to work out twice this week. I was able to work out twice this week. There's no judgment in that. It is, it is a true fact. I'm just a walker. I walk. Verbs are verbs. I got a little movement today. I moved today. Even here in the inflection of my voice, my brain naturally goes, ah, this is the truth. This is exactly what it is. I'm trying to do a little bit each day. I'm doing a little bit each day. It's okay to take it easy. Take it easy, y'all. Just do it. I will be sued by Nike one day. <laughs> Nike would make 10 times as much money if their statement was, do it. <laughs> when I was a little boy, back to that story, standing on the edge of the diving board, I need to validate my young seven-year-old manhood. All the other children down the pool, what are they saying? Just jump, just jump. And in my head, I'm saying, this is not a just act for me. <laughs> I am deathly scared right now that if, for two things. If I jump, I will die. If I don't jump, I will affirm exactly who the world has told me that I am. Nike, do it. Second tenet is your intuition. I like to say your intuition is the voice that says, hey, do that. That seems right and good. If every single person listen to that voice, that voice that is actually on our side. Our body is actually pretty aware of, it's the reason why we got some fight and flight and some rest and digest. What if we actually invited people to recalibrate who they listen to? Because for the most part, a lot of the industry, consumer up, says don't listen to your voice, listen to the other voices because your voice is going to lead you to a bad place. In the animal kingdom, that's actually not true. Enoughness answers the question, am I worthy, am I valid, am I capable? And even though it's hard to accept, the answer is yes. And then it then asks the question to them, so now what can I do? One more idea, and then we'll move on. I like talking about health and happiness, because just like fitness, and food are woven together, health and happiness are as well. People in this room, you've spent your time, your money, your vocation, your passion, your knowledge to understand health and well-being. People associate their health with their happiness. Therefore, you all have as much influence on people's happiness as you do on their health. So this is me at London Marathon last November. I love marathoning, I hate running. <laughs> Here's what I mean. I don't like the act of running. I don't do a lot of it. But I show up on marathon days because I'm a glutton for being around people, doing things for purpose, for vision, for memory, for cause, because the world has said that they can't do it. There's no better environment I've ever been in. If happiness is at the pinnacle of your values pyramid, you end up doing things because. It brings you joy. If healthiness is at the pinnacle of your value pyramid, you end up doing things because it makes you healthier, stronger, faster, skinnier, fill in the blank. Now I'm going to note right now, neither of these columns are meant to be good or bad. Happiness, it leads to memories that are directly correlated with what you did rather than how you did the things that you did. Healthiness, it provides the pathway to greater accomplishments, new capacities, and a socially acceptable body. Happiness, 
It's success is measured by how it makes you feel. Healthiness, it's success, I guess we could stop by, it's success is measured, period. Or, in if you accomplish what you set out to do and changes in you that can be seen by others. Happiness, it is something that you don't have to be good at to accomplish your goal. Healthiness, it is something you have to show up and suck, you have to earn your stripes, you have to have the will and guts to stick with it, to in time be equitably respected for your actions. I'm probably gonna text Jessica and be like, hey Jessica, do you wanna do some pro bono research on this idea because I think it would be true and worthwhile proving? I seem to know more people who seek happiness, who find healthiness, than people who seek healthiness and find happiness. And they evolve. So attentively listening to one's intuition in the moment, enoughness, brings, and br brings together and bridges one's happiness and healthiness. So consider this this week. It's really cool that you take time to go, I'm going to think about how I do what I do. I'm going to learn. I'm going to be challenged. I'm going to be in conversation with one another. I'll be here till Thursday. Follow me on the Instagram. Follow just, like Talk with people about what are the little things that I can do that will create light within this cycle that will allow people to go, oh, yes, what I'm feeling has a lot of merit. And when I acknowledge it, I can start doing little things as the consumer myself to derail it. That's a hard act to follow. <laughs> um, thank you so much, JC. All right, I want to bring back the great disconnect that Jessica brought up earlier that came up about consumers and dietitians as a part of this research. Um, as most of you know, and per my introduction, I am a registered dietitian. And I wanted to share with all of you how difficult it was for me to get these results when Southpaw Insights presented them to us. To read the responses from the dietitians in this amazing research that represent our profession. To read how disconnected we are from where the consumer is at, it hurt. It broke my heart. It was a really, really hard pill to swallow. But I am here to also share with all of you that we share similarities with consumers that can and do serve us really, really well. Now, Jessica highlighted this a lot earlier. We share the exact same two priorities with consumers when purchasing and making food decisions, taste, and cost. I get it. It's not rocket science, but it should not and cannot be dismissed. Sharing these two similarities with consumers enables us as dietitians to better relate and resonate with consumers. And in fact, of all the data that Jessica shared, and it is rich and it is plentiful, I would argue these two data points alone showcase that there is no other profession that can better speak to the consumer's truth than dietitians. You have the power and the influence to derail the cycle of shame. And through your communication and education, you have the ability to change the nutrition narrative from one based on morality to a nutrition narrative rooted in accessibility and help communicate to consumers that nutrition can be found in all parts of the grocery store, including the perimeter and the center of the store. Now, we mocked up a few um, typical aisles here that you would find in the center of the store of your local grocery store. And you can see in that first aisle, we have canned fruits and vegetables, canned beans and fish, and frozen fruits and vegetables. And I would just say collectively as a whole, all of those foods provide plentiful amounts of vitamins and minerals and are bountiful in fiber and protein. 
And then you see the second aisle there, we have bread and pasta, which are enriched with B vitamins and iron. And then of course, last but not least, we have ready to eat cereal. Many cereals in the marketplace have whole grain, fiber, vitamins and minerals all in one bowl, which I can tell you is really hard to find in other breakfast choices. Yet 16% of the dietitians in this research tell clients to avoid the cereal aisle. And 19% of consumers actually try to avoid the cereal aisle, which is consistent with what the dietitians are saying. Now you've seen and heard a lot from the consumers that Jessica and her team interviewed, and you've heard JC and Jessica read quotes from a variety of the consumers, and I hope some of them have stuck with you. I will tell you a lot of them have stuck with us, and this quote in particular stuck with me. I've heard the products in the breakfast aisle are just complete sugar and have no nutritional value. And then thank you to you all. We put out a pre-survey and you guys answered a lot of questions and I'm greatly appreciative. And there were two statements of part of, as part of our pre-survey that we asked all of you to react to and I wanna read them right now. The first statement was, I believe all types of ready to eat cereal can be part of a healthy eating plan that supports an individual body weight goals. The second statement was, I believe all types of ready-to-eat cereal, including sweetened and plain grain, are nutrient-dense and thus would recommend them as a breakfast option. For the first statement, the one that is connecting ready-to-eat cereal intake to body weight outcomes, about 40% of you either disagreed or were on the fence with that. The second statement about pre-sweetened or plain grain cereals being nutrient dense and you would recommend them as a breakfast option, 60% of you either disagreed or were on the fence about that. So I now wanna take this time to dig into the power of the cereal bowl. Hands down, one of the most misunderstood and hands down one of the most shamed foods in the grocery store. Tonight, I want to talk about the facts of ready to eat cereal and hopefully help you all feel confident and empowered to make ready to eat cereal a part of your recommendations as you deem fit. I'm going to present to you two new and two very different published nutrition research studies. One that is focused on ready to eat cereal and nutrient intake and the other which is focused on ready to eat cereal and body weight. We're first going to dig into the research study that is focused on ready-to-eat cereal and nutrient intake. Now, when we embarked on this research, we leveraged the coveted Dietary Intake Research Data Set, otherwise known as NHANES. And at the time that we embarked on this research, the latest NHANES data set that was available to us was from 2017 to 2018. And we broke out Americans into two distinct groups those that eat ready-to-eat cereal for breakfast, and those that eat an other breakfast. Now, if you are curious, what are Americans eating for breakfast when they're not eating ready-to-eat cereal? Well, here they are. Top five breakfast foods consumed by Americans according to N. Haynes 2017-2018. Yep, ready-to-eat cereal leads the way, and that includes both plain grain and sweetened. Then we have donuts and pastries, followed by eggs and omelets, and that includes egg dishes like quiches. Then we have frozen breakfast, largely dominated by frozen waffles and frozen pancakes. And then last, bread, often in the toasted format and often with a margarine or butter spread. Now, when Americans are eating cereal, they are eating it with what N. Haynes calls an addition. I like to say it's just you're eating ready to eat cereal with something else. So no matter what age group you look at on this slide, about 90% of the time, consumers are eating ready-to-eat cereal with something else. Top two foods consumed with ready-to-eat cereal, 90% of the time, probably not a surprise. Ready-to-eat cereal is consumed with good old cow's dairy milk. And 15% of the time, consumers eat their cereal with a piece of fruit. Now that picture is very intentional. The number one fruit 
consumed with a bowl of cereal by leaps and brown, bounds like no other fruit even comes close as a good old banana. Now, I always pause here when I'm presenting this because I love this slide. I love these stats. We all know, or at least we do on this stage, that ready-to-eat cereal in and of itself is nutrient-dense. And for those of you who are questioning me that, I'm going to get to that in just a minute. But what this shows is that ready-to-eat cereal attracts nutrient-dense foods like milk and fruit. All right, let's get to it. Let's look at the total daily nutrient and food group intake among those that eat cereal versus those that eat an other breakfast. What's the other breakfast? It's an accumulation of those four other breakfasts I just showed to you momentarily ago. Now, we wanted to focus our research, so we looked at the very nutrients that the Dietary Guidelines for Americans recommends each and every one of us get more of in our daily diet. We looked at the food components of public health concern. I like to call them the big four, calcium, vitamin D, potassium, and fiber. These are the four nutrients that nearly every single American, two years and older, is falling incredibly short on in their daily, not just a little short on, incredibly short on in their daily diet. We also looked at what the Dietary Guidelines calls the under-consumed nutrients by life stage. Now these aren't as bad as the big four, but they're bad enough where their Dietary Guidelines recommends we get more of them in our daily diet. All right, let's take a look at the contribution of ready-to-eat cereal versus the other breakfast to daily nutrient intakes. And we're gonna start off with the big four, vitamin D, calcium, fiber, and potassium. And as you can see, ready-to-eat cereal breakfast contributed to 58% of the daily intake of vitamin D, 35% of the daily intake of calcium, and 27% of the daily intake of fiber and potassium, while the contribution of the other breakfast was lower in each. So yes, total daily nutrient intake of the food components of public health concern are higher among ready-to-eat cereal breakfast eaters. This trend continues when we look at the under-consumed nutrients. Ready-to-eat cereal contributed to a higher percentage of the daily intake of all, all of these under-consumed nutrients, including whole grain, ranging from 56% to 27% of the daily intake, while the contribution of the other breakfast contributed less. In fact, the only two under-consumed nutrients that the other breakfast delivered more of was choline and protein, and for very good reason. Eggs naturally contain choline and are obviously a beautiful source of high-quality protein. Cereal doesn't fortify with choline, and cereal is not a protein-centric meal. But outside of those two, total daily nutrient intake of the majority of these under-consumed nutrients was higher among ready-to-eat cereal breakfast eaters. And of course, we looked at nutrients to limit, right? These are the very nutrients that the dietary guidelines tell us to get less of. And when you look at the contribution of calories, you can see each breakfast contributed about the same, 20%. Added sugar, exactly the same, at 22%. But where ready-to-eat cereal really shines is with saturated fat and sodium, contributing lesser amounts of each when compared to the other breakfast. So yes, total daily nutrient intake for saturated fat and sodium are lower among ready-to-eat cereal breakfast eaters. And then last but not least, food groups. We looked at whole grain and we looked at dairy. And I don't know and don't care where you look on this chart, wherever your eyes gravitate to, you will see that the ready-to-eat cereal eaters are getting more servings of whole grain and more servings of dairy when compared to the other breakfast eaters. So, in conclusion, nutrient, whole grain, and total dairy intakes are higher among ready-to-eat cereal breakfast eaters versus other breakfast eaters. So consumers can rest assured and feel good when they eat cereal for breakfast versus feeling shamed. When it comes to nutrient density, ready-to-eat cereal is really hard to beat. Like I said earlier, many cereals have whole grain, 
fiber, vitamins and minerals, all in one bowl, which as you now can see, is really hard to find on other most commonly consumed breakfast items. All right, now let's look at the publication that was recently published on ready-to-eat cereal consumption and body weight in children and adolescents. Before I get to the results, I wanna ground you in how we approach this research. It was a comprehensive systematic review of published literature in English since the year 2000. We included both observational and randomized controlled trials. And the objective of us doing this research was to evaluate the effect of ready-to-eat cereal intake on body weight outcomes in children, adolescents, and adults. 51 studies were included. 25 of those included children and adolescents. One manuscript has been published in Advances in Nutrition, and those are the results I'm gonna share with you tonight. And those are the results on ready-to-eat cereal in children and adolescents. The other manuscript on adults is currently under review. All right, let's take a look at the observational studies in children and adolescents. There were 18 cross-sectional studies. 12 of them reported an inverse association with ready-to-eat cereal and weight outcomes, meaning the more the kids ate cereal, the lower their weight. Zero showcased a positive outcome, meaning there was no weight gain as they increased their cereal intake, and six reported no association, no weight gain or weight loss. There were two prospective cohort studies. I love prospective cohort studies because they allow us to follow up the participants. And there was one of these publications that studied boys and ready to eat cereal intake and followed up with them seven and a half years later. And it showcased that the boys who consumed higher amounts of cereal had a lower body mass index. The other study examined children who live in households with a lower income and followed up with them three years later and showed the exact same thing. That lower income households who ate more cereal had a lower BMI. So in summary, most observational studies demonstrated that children and adolescents consuming ready to eat cereal have a lower body weight. Now, I know a lot of you might be thinking, what about sugar, right? It's like the elephant in the room always, and I love to talk about the elephant in the room, for those of you who know me. Four out of five of the studies reported pre-sweetened, ready-to-eat cereal consumers had a lower BMI than children who ate another breakfast or skipped breakfast. More interestingly, is when we looked at the observational studies that compared pre-sweetened cereal eaters versus non-pre-sweetened cereal eaters, two studies showed no difference in BMI, while one study actually showed a lower BMI in those kids who ate the pre-sweetened cereals. So contrary to concerns about added sugar and ready-to-eat cereal, this would suggest that benefits of body weight outcomes are observed with consumption of non-pre-sweetened cereal and sweetened cereal. So in summary, a limited number of studies indicate sugar content of ready-to-eat cereal did not affect the observed inverse association of ready-to-eat cereal consumption and weight outcomes. And then finally, randomized control trials. We only found five of them and all five showed that there was no increase in body weight among those who increase their consumption of ready-to-eat cereal. So in conclusion, research shows that children and adolescents who consume ready-to-eat cereal have lower body weights compared to children and adolescents who don't eat cereal. And this is just one of the reasons why we so wholeheartedly believe in cereal. We firmly believe that the good nutrition and bowl of cereal has the power to change lives. Starting the day with cereal is one of the easiest ways to make a nutritious choice. At breakfast, cereal is the number one 
source of whole grain, the number one source of fiber, the number one source of several key vitamins and minerals, including zinc, iron, folate, vitamin A, and a whole laundry list of vitamin B, B vitamins. Cereal, it delivers good nutrition that families need at an accessible price. On average, a bowl of any General Mills Big G cereal, whether it's Cheerios or Chex or Cinnamon Toast Crunch, with milk costs about 50 cents a serving. And I know I've said this before, and this will be the last time I say it, but no matter the flavor or variety, cereals contain a lot of good stuff like whole grain fiber, vitamins and minerals, which is truly hard to find in other breakfast choices. Nutrition can be found in a box. Nutrition can be found in the center of the store. Nutrition can be as easy as a bowl of cereal. So how in the world do I end this, huh? <laughs> oh, I'm gonna be honest with you, I'm not really sure uh, how to do that. Uh, but here's what I do know. That is that. I want you to think about your clients. I want you to think about your friends, your families, who may be in this cycle of shame. And now because of tonight, you're better equipped to recognize the shame. Because of this, it's gonna be critical for you to continue this journey and incorporate the things you learned tonight so that you can help derail the cycle of shame. You can now more clearly see people and the shame they carry and can help derail it through your effective communication and your impeccable nutrition leadership. With that, on behalf of Jessica, JC, and myself, we thank you so much and we welcome to you. Good. I'm not shy. <laughs> that, was a, that was a lovely presentation. It was really wonderful. I, got, I think we all got a lot out of it. So here's the question I have. You guys are, you all are punting to us in our communications, and I appreciate that. However, the, I think among the bigger challenges that we as a profession have is that we don't get the recognition in the media, and it goes lots of ways. It has to do with um, who is being, you know, given the opportunity to write, who's calling us for interviews or not, who's being dubbed the experts, right, in the nutrition space. There are a lot of doctors that are giving out this incorrect information and doing that too, and that you didn't touch on that, but that's a big problem that we run up against. That's part of why I got a doctorate, so somebody could call me doctor yeah. and talk, I'm serious, yeah. and teach yeah. at a university, yeah. Um, and the other thing, you know, something I paid attention to is I think the media as a whole is, you showed those awesome ads, but the media is just as bad, and brands that hire celebrities and athletes you know, like we all compete for spokesperson work and doing media work, and it's really hard to differentiate yourself when you're competing with Gwyneth Paltrow, you know, or you're competing with influencers that maybe do a better job at entertainment. And, you know, that's like, when I first started looking at TikTok, I'm like, do I have to dance? Like, how is this dance? <laughs> Roseanne. <laughs> Roseanne and Liz. Roseanne and Russ, like her videos crack me up. I don't know how she has the time to think about that, but I'm just saying, like, I think some of us could, we are, some of us are already being incredibly effective, but we're not able to magnify our voice, and unfortunately our parent organization has come under scrutiny for so long, and everybody thinks that dietitians you know, we're behind the times, you know. I, I hear what you're saying and I see that, but I also have conversations with other folks, I mean, even the fitness professionals, because I wear both hats, so I know what goes on in that space. Um, and it's really frustrating, so it's like, 
I, I'm really happy to take all of this and use it in a productive manner, but even if the most 100 peasant dietitians or maybe more are never going to change the whole landscape when we are set up for failure sometimes in terms of being the nutrition communicator and the, and the wellness communicator. So what do you suggest? <laughs> it's great. I need a cigarette. <laughs> You know, we just learned that not smoking and uh, smoking cessation leads to type 2 di to diabetes. So. Okay. Uh, so I will I, I will start uh, by saying nothing I'm going to say right now is going to um, answer your question. <laughs> because it's that complex. My my number one claim is to do little things often. And, and here's, here's, what I'll, here's how I'll say that. I have, uh, I'm gonna make a number, I have 5,000 followers on Instagram. Which is a lot, compared to people who have a lot more. And it's more than people who have less. I know that's a really, like, but sometimes people say, I don't have a big following, therefore, or I have a big following, therefore, someone else has a bigger following than me, therefore, they. But the thing I will say is my following, I know most of them. I've gotten to run around today and hug people um, who I've never met before because I feel like I know them. So the power that you have in this room is to think about the people that you know and to impact them. Be and again, this, I know this is underwhelming because 100,000 dietitians, is that, is that the number? Probably more. Probably, but let's, let's say it's 100,000. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a theater director too, um, and I often spend the last couple weeks going, we have 10,000 things left to do, we have 10 people in this cast. How do we accomplish 10,000 things? And I have every single person put post notes up on the wall of the things that they need to work on. And when they get done doing that thing, they take it down, and all of a sudden a wall filled with post notes in a day. You can see the impact. Because all of a sudden, you start going, here are the people that trust me, because here's the reality with influencers. Most people don't actually follow influential people. They follow the people who influence them. You are all influencers. Culturally, I know that's not true. There's other people that have greater influence than we do collectively, but intrinsically, when we go, if someone is, let's, uh, let, Felicia, let's say someone is who, like, I don't go to the gym. You say, come with me. They will go with you because of you. Not because of the world that they're going to be in, but because you are going to be their line of clarity. So my underwhelming answer is to see the value of doing little things often. Because things, as they used to be, things are changing. People are raising different voices. And then a louder voice goes, wah! And it seems like everything is washed away. It's not. Underwhelming, but I think in the long term, sustainable and effective. And we all need to be louder. Thank you for knowing about a microphone. In an age of amplification, we've stopped understanding that we have power in our voice without it. I wish I would pay you $5 to do exactly that. Because that was a perfect moment. I will pay you, I will bend while you have it. Were any anybody else going to partially answer that or not? No, I feel like I'm still smoking. <laughs> uh, no, I feel like JC captured it well. Okay. okay, all right. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, happy to nice dietitian, everybody. Um, so I'm a dietitian, I'm a fitness and yoga instructor, and trust me, I have shame deeply from years, and I would teach classes and say nonsense like, sweat is fat crying, and, um, you know, Memorial Day weekends next week, who's ready to put their bathing suit on? Like, not like that. Um, that's not why I came up here Um No, actually, much like Amy, I, I'm a fan of elephants in the room as well, and you brought up the word accessibility. When I had private practice, I was an insurance-based practice, and I brought a lot of people into it and was able to help a lot of people. There are a lot of dietitians 
who don't accept insurance. And two biggest reasons why they don't, it's too hard, I don't know how to do it, and I'm not gonna make enough money. Is that shameful? Yes, being silly to her. That's right. That's not true. There's a lot that's covered that people don't know about. And, and again, this comes back to education. Are we teaching, are we teaching people about insurance? In general, like, who learned about insurance in school? Okay. One person. Are they, are they teaching you insurance? Are they teaching insurance? Okay, well, we all want you to go back to your program, clearly. Um, but they're not teaching insurance schools, so we have to figure it out on our own. And again, there's that conversation of, oh, well, they don't cover enough. I had plenty of people who I did, if they didn't come to me for diabetes and renal, they were coming to me for general nutrition. And there are already opportunities there to help people. And again, I think it's just a matter of how we're, as, us as dietitians, able to, to put that out there and, and to encourage folks to look at other ways that we can be accessible. Yeah. So, so I, uh, I will say this. Uh, to your question of is this shameful, I will say we are all, it's, it's too complex of a question to say yes or no. Because as I started today, I apologize for the fitness industry. <laughs> Why do fitness people give nutrition advice? Because right. they're making $25 a class and they have seven classes a week. And they, if they don't get their numbers up, they will lose those seven classes a week. They're making $175 a week. So what do they do? They go, I need to do everything I can because um, in, the, in the pandemic, gyms were saying, you need to let us open because people need us for their mental health. And I was wonderfully, heartfully saying, I'm sorry, they do not need you for their mental health. They need movement, they need community, which they can find without paying you $110 a month. What you're really saying is, we've created a system in society that does not allow fitness to be a sustainable industry. And therefore, all of a sudden, fitness people are going, what do I do? And I answer this question the same way. We are not going to get rid of shame. We will shame ourselves. We will shame people. We will make mistakes. We will make missteps. That's why the answer is shining light on the why and the what. My, my, my chiropractor uh, is a non-insurance-taking chiropractor. And I know exactly why. Why do I go to that chiropractor? Because there's a relate, yeah, look, there, 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 there's a relationship and connection. Which to the Felicia to that same point again. Hi. Uh, to that same point again. Yeah, like like at the end of the day, all of this should make us go. I understand the importance of my work because we are dealing with systems that are not set up for us to be successful. People's health should not be the thing that they have to decide to go. Oh, for, for Mother's Day, I'm getting my wife, uh, you know, 10 trips to the registered dietitian's office for her own self-care. I'm gay, I don't have a wife. Uh, but, 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 but to that point, self-care becomes something that we think of is reserved for these people. So your answer, yeah, it actually may be, we may actually make people feel some shame because they're not rich enough to go see a dietitian. Is that, are we responsible for that? We can influence it. We can shine light on it. We can say it loudly. Yeah. Will it change anything? Over time, it'll make people have positive friction applied to them. And that's what we can do. Time out, are you Sydney Sydney? Yeah. Sydney just graduated from the school two days ago. Thank you. Here's a little nice asterisk you. next to the graduation. I haven't defended my thesis yet. So We don't oh. care, we're still gonna cheer for you. Hopefully I complete the program. We'll be fine. Um so <laughs> I will. I will. I will. You go. I will complete it. I will do it. Not just do it, but I will do it. Yeah, I hear um my question. Yes was, do you guys have any data on how shame might manifest or be experienced differently between men and women? Mm -hmm. And how can we shape our messaging to resonate with both? Because mm -hmm. there is other data on how it might be different between um, sexes, but 
What did you guys see? If you imagine it. We didn't look in depth at that, but we can. And we will. And we'll get back to you. Because there's so much more data. I really feel like we've only scratched the surface yeah. today. There's a ton more to get into. So the stage again, you'll be seeing us again. Yeah. Can you talk about all to how we might be able to shape our messaging to reach both men and women as nutrition experts and communicators? Well, we, I guess what I'm coming from is that a lot of us in here are females, yeah. and we, I guess, project our own experiences when we talk with uh, clients and uh, uh, weight populations and crowds and things like that. So how can we potentially address, like, addressing men as well? Does that make sense? <laughs> it, it does make okay. sense. Kind of sense. Was, was yeah. it all the consumer? No. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think even if you remember when JC brought up the the male that we often feature, yeah. it, it is interesting. I And I really appreciate your question. And now you're motivating us to dig into you're that. I can already tell. Because um, I thought Ronald was really, really interesting. We are a female dominated, dominated profession. And as JC, JC showed, we tend to talk to females, right? I mean, think about it. The industry, our communication. And Ronald felt alone. He 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 felt um, not connected, and he he felt like he had to go it on his own because the world wasn't speaking to him. So I think that is interesting, and we need to dig into that more. But even with the little bit that we saw from him today, there is something different there. Would you agree? Yeah, yeah. and I will say I, uh, in a smaller group, I presented a lot of this material six days ago, and the exact. Yeah verbatim the exact same question came up um, uh, and it's come up many times yeah and, and I appreciate that that question is coming out of a room like this yeah because it says that we see that our our what we have to give is universal and equitable um, and stating that more loudly um, like when do we walk into fitness spaces who do we see when yeah and and, and, and and why and why why is that not a, oh, this is interesting. How um, are they dressed compared to men? What's that? And how are they dressed compared to men? Yeah. Well, even like, like, like clothes that are, that are designed for and, you know, and like where people feel safe and we're on a spectrum of what is expected of them in a space. And maybe, maybe sitting to your point, what is expected of male identifying human beings within their own conversations about their own wellness? Um, I don't, uh, to your yeah. point on media, I don't hear it. To yeah. the conversation about so, social media, I don't see it. Um, now again, it may, it may be there, and it may be in a smaller, uh, quieter way. I think that's a good voice to raise up. Agreed. And, 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 and I'll joke again, the, you know, the old white straight male, like there's not a lot of things that they fall to the bottom of a, of a, of a totem pole on, but this is one of them. Yeah. Like, you know, I think of, you know, I, I think of those people and I do go, gosh, what are they supposed to do? Yeah. In the boutique fitness world, the only straight white men that I know who walk in, what do they all have in common? They have a wife. They have a wife who was a member first. And, and, and I ask questions like that to, to calibrate my own brain. Calibrate your own brains by asking those questions. Like, am I the only one who thinks X? And if you are, Think about it some more, or be the voice who raises it up. Um, because because we, we know there's disparity, we know there's imbalance. Why? Because we have systems of efficiency. Systems, change is happening slower today than it's ever gonna happen again. Beth Comstock said that in 2001. This is the most peaceful world we're ever gonna live in again. So with that being said, how can we hit the break and become a little less efficient for moments? in order to become more aware of what we're experiencing and create pathways. Yeah. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. Very good question. Yeah, great question. Very good. All good questions. Yeah, sorry. Hi. Hey, Hi. Question. I'm Melissa. Um, Hi, Melissa. I'm a teacher and researcher. So I'm wondering when we think about these changes that we can make, what policies do you think we can advocate for as dietitians to make these changes? Yeah, I mean, I, that's a, a loaded and beautiful question. I, I mean, for me, in terms of policies and the FDA, 
Um, right now there is a proposed new definition for what healthy should be. Um, and I think it is incredibly narrow, incredibly catered to the rich and the wealthy, and does not take into account the everyday American who is working paycheck to paycheck to just feed their family. And so we need to raise our voices, lift them up and be louder to help um, be the representative for the bulk of America who doesn't have a Whole Foods, who doesn't even have a Walmart. Yet FDA is telling us that healthy can only include certain things. And if it includes anything else, it is deemed as unhealthy. My personal and professional opinion, that will hurt public health, not tomorrow, we won't feel it, maybe not even in our lifetime, but in 20 years, it will have a significant impact on the micronutrient and the overall health outcomes of Americans. So as dietitians, we have to ask ourselves, is this representative in go going to help the bulk of America, not just the elite and privileged, respectfully? That would be my biggest champion for us as a dietitian when it comes to policy. Thank you. Because we're at oh, seven, we're at seven to fifty, yeah. so sure. we'll keep doing so, questions. Yeah, we're going to keep doing questions and and Good. drinking, <laughs> which I never thought I would say. I love it. Um, but we are going to be at Fancy twenty twenty three as a pre symposium to continue this conversation and elevate more insights from the research we did that we didn't talk about tonight. So if you guys are going to be at Fancy in Denver, check out our pre symposium and register to continue this dialogue. All right, just wanted to say that. Thank you. Hi. So hi. Great dress. Thank you. Yeah. My name is Kim Lovely, and I am a registered dietitian. And I'm in private practice in New Hampshire, and I am 58, so I've been in practice for 30 years. So I'm old. Um, so I'm also a major fitness advocate, and I'm also a certified life coach. Good call. Because of the money thing. Ah. So the big elephant, ugly thing, and I love my friend Karen's word is insurance is bullshittery. So we haven't brought this up. Insurance pays me because I identify people's body weight. They do not pay me if I kneel. <laughs> right? Oh, wow, it's really, really good to know. Right? Oh. Referrals come to me oh. for a five-year-old diagnosed with obesity. If I'm going to get paid to see that child, you have to put the and that child is, and that family is depending on their insurance to get service for their child, I have to identify that child as obese. So we have to start being aware of the insurance industry's yeah. complicit horribleness to this too. There are some insurance companies that will not you let you use a preventative code. So I see a six-year-old. I am not interested in calling a six-year-old obese. Absolutely I'm not interested not. in talking about it. I'm not interested in diets. I'm not interested in any of it. I would like to use a preventative code. Mm -hmm. I would like to be able to say this family is bring, bringing this child to me to protect their self-image, to make sure that they're the healthiest, most amazing kid that can be the president mm -hmm. of the United States if they choose to be, right? Absolutely. See, that's what I want to do. But their insurance company won't pay for me to do a preventative service. They will only pay because I identify that child as being a bull So, like, yeah. and as Karen said, insurance is bullshitter. <laughs> it, is, it is a barrier. And it is a reason why there are people yeah. not practicing and refusing to take it, right. because it determines yeah. how we practice. Yeah. And and my life coaching arm. Yeah. Is because I can practice the way I want to. Interesting. And if so insurance won't pay for it anyways, then why why don't you know? It's it's terrible. And I love my profession. Like I said, I've been in dietitian for thirty plus years. Right. I'm good at it. I'm very good at it. And I, I'm proud of the work I do, but I'm sick of the bullshit yeah. of delivering decent care. Yeah. And God help you if you have Medicaid. God help you. Because their reimbursement rates yes. are quarters of what Harvard Pilburn might get. Oh, that's the last thing. Right? So, like, the access piece, we have to give access to people that are paying for their health insurance, too, mm -hmm. right? These families mm -hmm. are, their health insurance. Premiums are coming out of their paycheck on a weekly basis, right? Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And we have to identify these kids with horrible labels. <laughs> Which I is, literally have kids that come into my office and are already crying because they have been told that they are obese. And the first thing I do is say to them, I, you are the most amazing, spectacular, beautiful, incredible kid, and I will make sure that you know that. And yeah, it's bad. It's so bad. It's shittery. And I'm yes. so oh, grateful for you. Like no words. Yeah, I'm so grateful for you coming to the microphone and expressing that. So first... Thank you. You didn't know that, right? I didn't know that. Yeah. And I am going to dig into that like a blast. Yeah. But like, he's like, I need your phone number. Look at the insurance. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my God. Okay. Let's see. Yeah. yeah. Look at the insurance that you carry. Yeah. And actually call them and find out what diagnostic codes would you cover for me to go to a dietitian. Be curious about your own insurance. What yeah. is their bias? They, they, may, they might exactly. actually tell you the wrong information because they make you the bit. I can't oh, bullshit. It. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so I'll let you go. Yeah. No. Th thank you for that. Well, thank you so much. Don't ever accept Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Now it's the truth. Oh, it's hard. It's so hard. Mind blown. It's a clean liver piece band. Both of us have. Assistance, right? And, yeah. And we be my time. I spent arguing with insurance company to pay me. It's astounding. Yeah. Well, so we do the service, and then we yeah. beg. Yeah. Beg. So that's why insurance. That's why some game. dietitians don't accept yeah. the checks. <laughs> There's like I'm not on a plain scale. Yeah. I get why they do that. But in my, I live about an hour away from her in New Hampshire. And I'm one of, I'm the only pediatric dietitian in my area who took hate Medicaid. Yeah. I mean, if they, if I don't accept Medicaid, they don't get C. Yeah. And they freaking pay me $17 an hour to these kids. Right. It's, it's like, oh, sorry. No, no sorry. No, no apologies. Yeah. Well, and, and if I can point out this exchange right here, I mean, again, like, this this research happened. I mean, again, how is it 2023 and we've never done any research on food fitness body shaming in the United States? I know the answer because what industries would pay for it? Exactly. Food or fitness? Right. What in this, what company paid for it? Crucified General Mills sugar cereal bad people. Right. Because it's like we actually think there's something here. Again, mm -hmm. it's underwhelming, but making the connections to people who can like. I didn't know that, right. and now others can amplify it. Now again, change happens all of the time in history books, because we go from 1637 to 1687, this thing happened, and we go, oh, we realize 50 years is, or 10 years or five years, like this little act, which is often, often undervalued, yeah. is exactly that. Now again, that should not make anyone feel like, oh, that's good, but it should make us go, like Amy's like, no, 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 no. Like, that should make us feel good. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, not to say, I'm great. Oh, I'm sure it's right. Everybody. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yep. It's complex. You don't, you don't it's complex. Yeah. Yep. yep. We hear you. <laughs> Hi. They're at the microphone this time. <laughs> you heard me. My, my, um, well, I figured I would come up and actually be official. <laughs> uh, I'm Jessica. I, I just, uh, I'm also a dietitian uh, um, in Connecticut. And I used to be a retail dietitian at ShopRite. Oh, <laughs> Love retail dietitian. Um, unfortunately, used to be uh, my store got bought out and they eliminated my position. So. Um, but first I needed to say thank you to General Mills because my rep was amazing. And we got so many donations for our food banks and they always, always, always supported everything. My, the owner before he retired was like the biggest proponent of supporting food banks and food pantries. As soon as COVID hit, he was like, call all the pantries now and find out what they need. So thank you on of behalf of ShopRite. <laughs> love ShopRite. Um, yes, we lo I love them too. I wish I still had my job because I was seeing a lot of 
patient, I, my job was he paid me and I saw people for free. You know, I go to the senior center and I chat and I go to, I, I take people in the store and I see them in a private setting and it was free. They didn't need insurance. They didn't need anything. They just needed their shop rate card and everybody has a shop rate card. Right. There's a shop rate around. Um, when he also, I just, to share this, I, that really is no question yeah, right now. I have a question, but um, when he retired, he um, owned two stores and one of them was not purchased by um, the other family and it shut down and it was in Waterbury, Connecticut and Waterbury is basically now a food desert. There's Walmart stop and shop in Aldi um, and it's a city like Waterbury, Connecticut's a city and it's yeah. massive and ShopRite was one of the places where Actually. you know you get cheap good food yeah. for you know reasonable prices. There was always people looking to help whatever um, and a dollar ninety nine for a box of Cheerios goes a long way. Sure does. Um, it's covered by EBT, yes, so with milk, so are bananas, so that's like you know, the, you know, the breakfast of champions. Um, but so anyway, I just wanted to share that. So thank you, and thank I thought you for the that presentation was wonderful. And um, so what's next on the agenda? That's what my question is for you. I, I love Other that. Than exploring in insurances. And I, I think I'm going to explore <laughs> health insurance, yeah. so that's going to make my boss super happy. But who cares? It's awesome. I, I, I think it. you actually I can. I, you know, you have a lot. I, it yeah. seems like you have you have a lot of power behind you. I hope you do. Yeah. Well, thank you for that story. I think exchanging these stories is really powerful. And it elevates the awareness and the biases that are in our education and our community. And so I appreciate these stories. And next steps right now is we're going to peel back more layers of the research that we did. And we're going to continue to tackle topics that enable nutrition to be more accessible to all. Bottom line, that's why I exist in this company and why I exist in this role. And I believe there is such power in processed foods. As a dietitian, I couldn't be prouder. So not all processed foods are created equal. And that simple messaging of bad and good has really hurt what Americans can do and what they think. And so we have to come together and help push those boundaries. And that's hard work. We're dietitians, right? Like, Felicia, you were saying, like, how do I compete with Gwyneth Paltrow and all these sexy people and da 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 da? I try. It's hard. So, it's okay, I'm though. I'm a dietitian, you're way really better. Right. <laughs> right, I mean, Gwyneth, like, has so many opinions on Gwyneth, right? But, like, ugh. That's an example. But it's a great example. But it's these stories, it's this little bit of bravery that we lean into this. We lean in and actually talk to the facts, not the cultural fad, the facts. Grounded in our nutrition degree, elevate this profession as the nutrition leaders and help celebrate all foods because some of us get a lot of money and some of us don't. So how do I dispense my paycheck to help feed my family in the best way possible? I don't give a rat's ass what anybody tells me is healthy. My job as a dietitian isn't to tell you what's healthy or what's not. My job as a dietitian is to help educate consumers where they can find something that fits their needs and lifestyle. So that's the story sharing. That's the next chapter of this, right? And, and that's what we hope to do as we continue this amazing journey that we started last year. So hopefully that helps. I don't know. Thank you all. We're going to be around. So, please.